Alabama's 2015 football recruiting class is filling up. We'll talk about some hits and some misses for the Tide, plus a wrinkle in Lane Kiffin's offense, all that and more right now on Tider Insider TV. Go inside the Crimson Tide. Tighter Insider TV with Rodney Orr and Kerry Harris. It didn't take long for former Alabama running back Alvin Kamara to find a landing spot. The Georgia native committed to Butch Jones and the Tennessee Vols on Saturday via his Twitter account. He'll play at junior college this year before wearing the Tennessee Orange in 2015. With that, we say good evening, everybody, and welcome in to Tider Insider TV, presented each and every week by Buffalo Rock, alongside Rodney Orr from TiderInsider.com. I'm Gary Harris. Once again tonight, Rodney, great Pepsi products from Buffalo Rock. I've been on vacation for a week, you know, so I figured I better go diet. Well, we popped the lid last week in your I, I heard. I heard. The word spread all the way down to the beaches, so that was good news, but I did not eat the best uh, the healthiest diet while no, I was on okay. vacation. Not so we're, to. we're going diet tonight. Well, Rodney, Alabama got some good news last Wednesday when I was on vacation. You know, ever since Ricky Town had decommitted, a lot of concern about a quarterback for the class of 2015. Concern no more. Blake Barnett chose Alabama over Oregon and Notre Dame. He had previously committed to Notre Dame at one time. Four star prospect from Corona, California, fills that void I mentioned when Ricky Town decommitted. And, Rodney, let's listen to him now. Tell us why he chose the Tide. In 2015, I'm uh, officially committing to the University of Alabama. I think Alabama is the place for me, and I think that it's a place that's going to build me uh, as, a, as a person as well as an athlete, and I think that's going to develop me the best and uh, make me most successful in life. All right, Rod, let's talk about Barnett. You and I have discussed this both on the air and off the air. Alabama's not going to make dramatic changes to its offense under Lane Kiffin. Still, though, there's no doubt it looks like they've been searching for a quarterback to be called, quote unquote, dual threat. Somebody that can not only stand in the pocket and throw the football down the field, but can make plays with his legs. Talk about why Barnett, first of all, is just important in this recruiting class, but secondly, the versatility that he brings to the position. Well, I think anytime you can get a big time quarterback, it's important. You know, since Ricky Town decommitted, it's kind of had that hole in the class. And, you know, Gary, this day and time, when it comes to rec quarterback recruiting, you have to get a guy usually by the early part of the summer, or you might not get a good one because quarterbacks are gobbled up really quickly. There's probably not a, a lot of guys that are staying in the pocket, you know, pro style quarterbacks out there this year, Gary, that were left at this time. You know, but when you look at Blake Barnett, he's a guy that certainly is that but he also has the ability to run, and I think people kind of get caught up in his ability to run when they watch his tape and the things that he can do. But again, he's just a guy who can throw the football really well, has a strong arm, he's a great leader, and has the ability, as you can see, to run. Well, we mentioned Oregon being one of his finalists. He's been compared to Marcus Mariota, the great Oregon quarterback. Now, he previously committed to Notre Dame, said he did that too quickly, and when he visited Alabama, quite frankly, Rodney, it wasn't expected that he was going to make a choice this soon. Most people felt like he would wait it out a while after having committed to Notre Dame so soon, but he was blown away on his visit. Yeah. I, I think really what happened, Gary, he made a decision to make that the visit down here. He was at the Baltimore Rivals Challenge up there a couple of weekends ago. He talked to some Alabama uh, prospects. His family was up there, and they kind of decided, hey, let's take a look at Alabama. They came down on the visit. Even though Alabama had been recruiting him extremely hard, he decided to go ahead and take the visit that uh, last week and when he did I mean it just certainly blew away he and his family and you know they didn't waste much time when they got back they canceled the visit to to Oregon made the commitment to Alabama a big pickup for the Crimson Tide once again more proof that Nick Saban can go anywhere in the country and snag a top recruit regardless of whether it's West Coast East Coast Deep South or all the way to Minnesota and places does. like that he can go anywhere but let's talk more recruiting in state and uh, not the best day for Alabama today. Two uh, in-state recruits were set to decide between Alabama and Auburn and both picked the Tigers. 
Let's start with Tyler Carr from Southside Gadsden. No surprise here, Rodney, quite honestly. He uh, comes from an Auburn family. His dad's a graduate there. Would have been a surprise, I think, had he gone anywhere yeah. other than Auburn. Yeah, I, again, I, I think when you're looking at Tyler Carr, and he's a, he's a there, there's Jalen Harris actually there making that catch. But we'll talk about him in a minute. Tyler Carr from Gadsden, Southside offensive lineman. You know, Gary, Alabama really needs tackles. And I know that Tyler Carr plays tackle in high school. I think when you really look at him, though, technically, he's probably going to be a guard on the next level. So, again, I think with that, along with the fact that he does have the ties to Auburn, certainly made him a natural for, for Auburn. So no surprise there. Jalen Harris, though, the tight end from St. James in Montgomery, a little bit of a different story. Alabama had really recruited him hard. No doubt, Rodney, that uh, the Tide would have liked to have gotten a commitment from Harris, who just a few minutes ago announced for Auburn. Well, actually, Alabama just recently offered him, as did Auburn, as a matter of fact. But, uh, you know, he had a really good camp at Alabama. Alabama was also, as we talked about, recruiting a kid named Jackson Harris, a tight end out of Tennessee who was committed to Georgia. But, you know, Alabama's still recruiting other tight ends. I think there are other guys that they like as much, maybe even more than Jalen Harris. The key is to find the right guy, Gary, a guy who can line up at that inline blocking tight end Y position that, that can also catch the football. And, you know, that's what they're looking for. They need to get a tight end like that. They've got Hell Hinches committed out of Missouri, who's more of an H back type guy, an athletic guy that can, you know, do things from that H back spot. But really, they need a bigger guy, maybe a more powerful blocker. So, 19 commitments already for 2015, but you do expect there to be another tight end in this class. I, I, yeah, I definitely think so. In fact, I just posted a story on a prospect just now, right after Jalen Harris's um, commitment. Will Gregg out of Arkansas is very highly regarded, been considering Alabama for a long, long time, and uh, has been here many times on visits, and he's one of the top tight ends in the country. Again, from the state of Arkansas, he'll be here again in the middle of July now. The problem is that he has a lot of connections to Arkansas. His brother Chris Gregg, right. as you know, plays for the Buffalo Bills, was an Arkansas player. But you know, Alabama's done extremely well recruiting the state of George, uh, the state of Arkansas. Billy Napier's done a great job up there in the past, and you know, so I think you know, keep an eye on Will Gregg. We'll see what happens. All right, we are talking about recruiting. Most of these guys have dreams of playing in the National Football League, and that's where our next story comes from. More strange news regarding Nick Saban from the NFL this past week. It wasn't another Saban coaching rumor. But Browns coach Mike Pettin said in an interview that Saban may have passed off a Jets playbook to his friend Bill Belichick of the Patriots. Pettin used to be the defensive coordinator for the Bills, but before that for the Jets. Saban immediately issued a statement saying that the playbook in question still sits in his office. Rex Ryan, who Saban is also good friends with, also denied that he thought Saban would give away a playbook for the Jets to a rival coach. So just when you thought you'd heard it all, Rodney, you have it when it comes to I'll Nick Saban. I'll tell you what, it Bill never Belichick. ends, does it? Conspiracy never theories ends. It's amazing. <laughs> amazing. That's for sure. Well, we've got much more Tighter Insider TV on the way, including Steve Spurrier making headlines discussing who else? Nick Saban. But next, we'll take a microscope to the Lane Kiffin offense, specifically the fullback position. How will Jalston Fowler be utilized in 2014? We'll discuss. And coming up, we'll be welcoming your phone calls emails and tweets you see the information on the screen interact with tighter insider television right now go ahead and give us a call send us an email or contact us on social media we'll be right back with the only show that takes you inside the crimson tide the one the only tighter insider tv will return right after this Former Crimson Tide fullback and Tuscaloosa County High Wildcat, Leron McClain was back in town Saturday for his annual youth football camp. He's currently an NFL free agent last year with the Chargers. He discussed with us the role of current Alabama fullback Jalston Fowler in the new Lane Kiffin offense. I can't wait to see him. You know, that's my favorite player right now since, you know, I heard when they was coming, bringing the fullback position back. So I can't wait to see him, you know, do his thing this year. And you know, I know Kiffin will uh, go have him in great situations. Uh, they got to go have great players around him. You know, so I'm looking forward to it. I hope he uses it, you know, at least about 70% of the game. <laughs> Too bad. Rodney, I don't know that we're going to see 70% of the time in two back uh, at Alabama, but no doubt. Uh, Jalson Fowler is going to have a bigger role this year than he did last year in this Lane Kiffin offensive system. How do you see Fowler? Well, role I, I think out? when you look at him, Gary, certainly he's a guy that's very capable of running, blocking. I think, you know, Lane Kiffin emphasizes that. And I mean, I think you're going to see Lane Kiffin utilize him as a receiver. And let me tell you, Jalston Fowler is an outstanding receiver. You're talking about a guy 200 
and 60 pounds. I mean, he's really got great hands, Gary. I think he can be very effective here. We'll see him out of the backfield, but uh, I mean, he is a tremendous wide receiver. And on a side note, do you remember the show we did announcing Justin Fowler's commitment several years ago and LaRon McClain was watching and called in. Yeah, I remember well. I made the comment that I thought he was a better prospect than LaRon coming <laughs> out. And, uh, but LaRon was good about that. He, he agreed. Well, we hope Justin will have his long NFL career. Well, hey, LaRon was fantastic. Had. There's no question. There's no doubt. But two guys, peas in a pod there. And LaRon McClain, a great fullback. And hopefully this will be the year Justin Fowler really makes his mark. Not that he hasn't been a good player already because he has, but maybe more opportunities. There you see his numbers and you can see when given the opportunity, he has certainly been effective, especially last year. Seven receptions, but five of them went for touchdowns. That's making the most of your opportunities and uh, everybody's excited that this guy has hung around and that this could be the year where he really breaks out. Well, if it's not coaches from the National Football League uh, poking a little fun or taking shots at Nick Saban, well, some of his counterparts in the SEC love to do it as well. And guess who we're talking about well, this time? Steve Spurrier always does it. <laughs> and it didn't just Saban, that's just Steve Spurrier's personality, but the old ball coach at it again notorious for his golf and the amount of time that he spends on his coaching duties. Sometimes people say he plays more golf than he coaches, but he's also been critical of coaches who do things differently, like Nick Saban, who spends much more time in the office. Here is his quote, and we'll read it to you. I told Nick Saban one time, I said, Nick, you don't have to stay there until midnight and your teams will be just as good and win just as many. Now, if you have the number one recruiting class every year and so forth, I don't know if he has maxed out potentially as well as he could. Ronnie, this coming from a guy who hasn't even won an SEC championship. Saban in seven seasons has won three national titles and two SEC titles, but Spurrier seems to think he should have done more. Well, let me say this. I mean, you remember Spurrier's run at Florida, and it was a great run. He won, what, six SEC yeah, but titles? One national title. One national title. Never let had me, an undefeated season. And let season. me tell you what, nobody really recruited better than Steve Spurrier. He had all those guys to recruit from in the state of Florida. He brought in all that talent. And he won one national and championship. And the SEC wasn't nearly as not deep even then nearly as, it is as competitive. Now. But I think he likes to have a little bit of fun. And hey, you know what? When Saban uh, people tweak him a little bit, he seems to always answer the bell. Keeping this in mind too, Alabama, when it's been picked number one under Saban preseason, has not won the national championship twice. When they've been picked number two, they've been pretty good at winning it all. So maybe the Tides' year. Well, more Tider Insider TV is on the way, including two Crimson Tide stars named to preseason All-American teams. And next, we'll be welcoming your phone calls, emails, and tweets. B.J. Milliken checking that Twitter account as we speak. There's the information on the screen on how you can get in touch with us, so please do that because we'll be right back with the only show that takes you inside the Crimson Tide. The award-winning Tider Insider Television will return after the break. It's the time of the year when preseason All-American teams have started coming out and they'll continue to do so right on through August. Athlon Magazine named Amari Cooper, the wide receiver, and Landon Collins, the Alabama safety first team selections. They're both sure to be on a number of teams as they are really, really good players. All right, let's go to our Med Center hotline and take some phone calls. Rod, you ready? Yep. First up tonight, our buddy John down in Moundville. Hey, John, welcome into TITV. Oh, thank you very much. How y'all doing? Very well, sir. I just wanted to know who's going to be the um, starting quarterback for Alabama. Well, John, I think, you know, again, you have to go through fall camp, and certainly you want to respect that because, I mean, Blake Sims had a, had a really great spring. And I think when you look at that, uh, you know, you, you, he's certainly going to compete once fall camp starts. And, you know, but Jacob Coker, Gary, I, you know, if I have to venture a guess, Certainly that's who I think would, would be the guy starting against West Virginia. But, again, it's just a guess. He still hasn't even taken a snap in practice. And, and not only that, you know, Cooper Bateman, too, made a lot of progress. So, you know, we'll have to see. But, John, if you're asking me to make a guess, I would say uh, Jacob Coker. Will be a spirited competition, John, and all those guys pushing each other will make whoever winds up being the starter a very, very good quarterback. All right, let's go down to Sylacauga and talk to Charles. Hey, Charles, what's going on? What's going on, man? How you doing, buddy? <laughs> all right. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, has Bo Scarborough made it on campus yet? And will he be starting um, training for the summer? Charles, uh, you know, Bo is still trying to get eligible. I think he was taking some classes. I think he took the ACT, in fact, uh, a Saturday or two ago. 
the last opportunity they give that. I mean, there's been a lot of positive vibes coming from over at County High that they really think he's going to make it. Gary, academically, and, and report possibly as uh, early as the first week in July when the second term begins. But, you know, Charles, right now, nothing official. We'll just kind of have to play it out. But, you know, like I said, the vibes have been pretty positive. All right, thanks for the phone call there, Charles and Sylacauga. Let's take an email. And this one is on Coach Anthony Grant, the Alabama men's basketball coach from Mike and Tuscaloosa. Do you think Coach Grant is feeling more pressure to win now due to all the success of the other Tide sports? Mike's a good question. Uh, my answer is no, I don't. I, I think coaches uh, put video, put pressure on themselves uh, as we look at some video here, Coach Grant, regardless of the situation. He wants to win. Uh, and I don't, I, I think it's the coaches that get excited about other sports doing well on campus. I think they feed off of each other. I would not say that there's more pressure because they're doing well. I think there's a lot of pressure because he wants to do well. And he knows he's only made it to the NCAA tournament one time. So, Rodney, I think uh, coaches put more pressure on themselves than outside influences could ever put well, on Well, the them. pressure is because the expectation is to win. And I think, yeah, I think there is certain pressure right now that, uh, you know, Anthony Grant feels to win. but. You know, Gary, it's, I think it's got an opportunity, chance to be a really uh, interesting team when you look at some of the newcomers that are coming in. Uh, certainly can contribute in a big way and maybe uh, put Alabama back into the NCAA tournament. All right, more Tider Insider Television coming up, including two Crimson Tide softball players that will continue playing through the summer. We'll tell you all about that. And coming up, more of your phone calls, emails, and tweets. Again, the information is on your screen, 205-348-9882. Email TITV at WVUATV.com or hashtag Tider Insider TV to reach us on Twitter. We'll be right back with more Tider Insider Television right after this. Only 17 softball players from around the country will compete for Team USA this summer, and two of them, Crimson Tiders, Jacqueline Trainer, who just wrapped up her eligibility, and Haley McClenney, who still has some left, were chosen to be a part of Team USA. It's Trainer's second time with the squad and Haley's first. Congratulations. All right, let's go right back to the Med Center phone lines here on Tider Insider TV and talk to Dale in Moundville. Hey, Dale. Hey, guys. How you doing? Very well. Uh, one guy that uh, looks to me like would be fighting for a start position and the Alabama coaches probably would expect to, a junior college guy, Dominique Jackson. Uh, uh, where would you see him starting on the offensive line if he was able to take a position? Well, I mean, you know, we'll kind of have to see where he, where he works, but I, I would expect that he'll get a look at guard and tackle. When, I, when I'm talking about tackle, I, I probably get a look at left tackle. You know, Cameron Robinson's a guy, that a true freshman, that I think probably will be Alabama starting left tackle, but I do believe that they'll give uh, Dominic Jackson a look there. I think he'll probably get a look at, uh, at right guard, possibly compete with Leon Brown there, probably get a look at right tackle. You know, Dale, what they do really early in camp is they give these guys, they kind of move them around, kind of find which guys fit best where, and I think we're going to kind of have to wait until then, but I do believe, Gary, when you look at Dominique Jackson, he was the number one junior college offensive lineman in the country last year. He's got great potential. It's just, you know, where is he going to figure in? And again, if you're asking me, I would probably say that maybe his best opportunity might be at right guard uh, competing with Leon Brown. All right, let's stay right here in Tuscaloosa and talk to Bob. Bob, welcome into the program. How are you? I'm doing good. How about you both of y'all? Very well. Go ahead. Uh, I was just thinking, you know, the toughest job in Alabama is to be a head coach of any athletic department. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you, Bob. Go ahead. Uh, do you believe that uh, coaching the Alabama football team, whether it's the football team or basketball or any other sport Alabama has, do you think that's the toughest, one of the toughest jobs here in the state of Alabama? Yeah, that's a good question, Bob. I mean, it depends on, on, you know, I guess your definition of tough. I mean, there are people out there who are, you know, struggling to pay the bills every month and, and, and struggling, you know, barely above the poverty level to make, a, to make a living. I would argue that that's a much tougher job than making several million dollars to coach a sport. Having said that, being a coach here at the University of Alabama is a very high visibility position 
and everybody is able to grade you daily on, on how you do your job. And if you don't do it up to their expectations, they're going to make a lot of noise about finding somebody else. So there is pressure. It is difficult in that regard, but uh, it's what these people have aspired to do. They're getting paid very well to do it at all of these uh, positions in, in terms of coaching teams at Alabama. So I think there is pressure. I think it's tough, but uh, I think they're, they're very good jobs to have. Oh, absolutely. I mean, but how many people, Gary, have the kind of exposure in their jobs in terms of everybody that can see, you know, their job, how they're doing on those jobs? And when you look at it, how many people could really hold up to the standards that they hold these coaches to on their jobs? I mean, that's certainly a, a something to consider. But again, I, yeah, it's a high stress position when you're a head, head coach whether it's football, basketball, whatever it might be, but certainly when you talk about the Alabama football coaching position, it's, it's probably the best coaching job in college football, but it's probably also the most uh, pressure-packed, so All right. to speak. Real quickly, our buddy Bill Taylor. Got to go fast, BT. What's up? Hey, Gary, that guy that's coming and uh, cleared the plate, would he be immediately uh, starting position or what? Now, you got to tell me what, what player you're talking about. The guard is, trend, uh, is eligible to play. Veradell. Uh, yeah, he'll have a chance to start. If it, it's, you're talking about Veradell, the transfer from Hawaii, the shooting guard for Anthony Grant, eligible immediately. Yeah, I think he'll factor in as a potential starter. He's got to go out and earn a spot. But as we've talked about before in the program, he can really – shoot it from long range and, and those guys are hard to find yeah they are and Alabama's needed them that's right all right still more tighter insider TV on the way more honors for Alabama golf imagine that and an update on a couple of tied golfers now at the next level that means professional golf stick around tighter insider TV will be back on a beautiful evening on the University of Alabama campus right after this The honors keep on rolling in for back-to-back -back national champion Alabama men's golf. Jay Sewell, the head coach, was named the Dave Williams National Coach of the Year. He's coached 28 All-Americans in his 12-year career at the Capstone and two national titles. Wow. Bud Colley rose as high as second place at the Travelers Championship this past week, and he shot 700 par to start at Allen Thursday before cooling down still, though he finished tied for 11th. That's a good showing, and uh, he needs to uh, get his exempt status back, so he needs some more good showing. On the women's side, what about this? Stephanie Meadow, just a few weeks ago playing for Alabama, made her pro debut in the U.S. Open. All she did was finish solo third. That's a six-figure payday. She is off and running the young lady from Northern.